I've only really one motivation for making television programs, and that is to change people's minds about things, to wake people up. I think we have the most unbelievably apathetic, unpolitically engaged society. Peter Kosminski likes to make mischief, as he says, but trouble is what he makes. He got a valuable BBC graduate traineeship in 1980, which gives him access to, in a few years, work, to anything he wanted to do in broadcasting, and got himself fired for organising a strike quite soon afterwards. He has made difficult films in areas of Northern Ireland, Shoot to Kill, he's done films about paedophilia, he's been in Bosnia, and there are two things about him that are remarkable. One is that he seems equally at home with drama and with documentary, and equally fearless. And the second is he always goes for a nerve point of a subject, whether it's uh, a nerve point in a literary reappraisal way, as he did with Wolf Hall, uh, or whether it's a nerve point in the general body politic, which is more his He's working on something on why young people go and join the, uh, the so-called Islamic State at the moment. He's uh, meticulous with his work. He isn't difficult to interview, but he's very, very careful. I think he feels that certain people are waiting to stitch him up, and that's been his fate for quite a few times. Certain people have thought he's gone too far. They've been worried about him. He worries people. But he worries the right sort of people who need to be worried so he can make the right sort of films, which he makes. Your background is quite political, wasn't it? Yes, my dad was a very political figure. Uh, and, and I learned my political outlook from him, you know, growing up in our house, watching the news, hearing my dad expressing very strong opinions. Uh, in a weird way, seeking my father's approval for what I was doing in my work, and although he was a much more radical figure than I was then or ever will be, has been an important part of my life. And even after he's gone, I still find myself thinking, well, would Dad approve of this? You know, would he think I'd got the story here? If you were to pick a few bullet points about how you got started in this business docudrama, whatever it is, what would they be? Well, I was working for David Dimbleby uh, on a program called This Week, Next Week, which was a, a sort of Sunday afternoon BBC One politics program. And there was a strike. A man called Paul Heyman made a documentary for the real live strand at the BBC called At the Edge of the Union. And it involved interviews with serving members of Sinn Féin. And Leon Britton, the then Home Secretary, called for the programme to be banned. So we all went out on strike, everyone. And it worked. The programme was eventually transmitted. But unfortunately, I was one of the ringleaders of the strike. And it was made clear to me informally that there was no future for me at the BBC. And David Dimbleby, who presented the programme, had a word with his brother, Jonathan Dimbleby, who at that time was presenting First Tuesday, the Yorkshire TV monthly documentary strand. And that's how I ended up leaving the BBC after five years and moving to Yorkshire television. His interest in political and social current affairs led him to make films about Russian soldiers in Afghanistan, Death Row in America and the Falklands. He moved into dramatized documentary with Shoot to Kill, a film about police killings of IRA suspects. Despite a BAFTA nomination and an RTS award for the best single drama, Yorkshire Television had to pay libel damages for its portrayal of RUC chief Sir John Herman. The Peter that you see now was the Peter then. Uh, and one of the reasons I employed him was that I felt that he was a maverick, a renegade, um, and therefore someone who probably had the capacity to stir things up. And yet also, when someone's career's gone slightly off the rails, they have a fierce determination to succeed. And I think from very early on, you realise that Peter was not just one of a crowd of documentary makers, but was someone who was going to really stand out. Taken on some tough subjects, perhaps none tougher than No Child of Mine. What drew you to that subject? 
I started to hear about this thing called conveyor belt abuse, which was a completely new concept to me. And in those days, it was defined as young kids who were sexually abused at home, were taken into care, identified by paedophiles in the care system, sexually abused in care, and ending up at the end of their conveyor belt as child prostitutes on the street. And so we researched it and we went ahead and made it. Nothing prepared me for the shit that fell upon me and all of us who worked on that show as a result of it. There was a immediate challenge to whether this, all this could have happened to one person. What did you make of that? We spoke, obviously, to the social services department that looked after her, and they became concerned that this was going to be a kind of expose of the failings of a particular social services department. They contacted a journalist at The Guardian, and they came out with the story that, that this... That she was a proven liar. That she was a proven liar. Yeah. Now, I was in an impossible situation. We had because she had it, we had her entire social services file. It was a lever arch file this thick. Everything that happened to her was detailed in it, chapter and verse. But I couldn't argue the case publicly to defend the film because to do so would be to confirm that the girl they were talking about was the girl who had been the source of our film. And I'd promised not to do that. So I just had to sort of stand there tight-lipped take the blows and say everything we did in the film has been legaled and checked, you know, and, and has satisfied the very high hurdles put up by ITV's um, lawyers. What effect did making the film have on you? Subsequently, both my daughters, of course, reached the age of 12. And looking at them and realizing that I'd asked Brooke to play that incredibly demanding role at that age, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how she did it. Any job since then to compare, it, it doesn't match up. I mean, the level of the writing and the, the, the acting that I had to do, you know, um, mm. I've not been able to do the same since. So it's only hard in that way, not in, not in any other that it kind of scarred me or affected me. I wouldn't ask a kid that age to play a role like that again. I still wonder now whether it was the right thing to do. I think the other really skillful thing about Peter is the way that he manages to uh, predict what's going to happen in society. So No Child of Mine really just foreshadowed the terrible grooming stories in, in, in northern towns that we've heard of for the last few years. Uh, the suicide bomber in Brits, again, was way before we really knew or heard much about suicide bombers but now they're almost commonplace. And Peter has an uncanny knack of actually just finding out what's going to happen. Good evening. British troops in central Bosnia have uncovered another massacre. It's an atrocity far worse than anything they've seen so far. I was sitting at home watching the television, and I saw a young soldier who'd just come back from Bosnia interviewed. And... It wasn't what he said, it was the look on his face. And he said, they were killing each other and we couldn't do anything about it. And I just had a feeling that there was a story here that we needed to dig out. What you get when you're here is, is little details. I mean, we saw washing lines with, there was a little, a pair of socks, dirty, you know, just hanging there. Now that Lee wrote that into the script, specific pieces of graffiti written on the sides of houses, the juxtaposition of houses that were still lived in by Croat families that had been untouched with the utterly destroyed and, uh, and firebombed houses of the Muslims just next door. You can read about that endlessly, but to stand there and experience it as we did is completely different. While the details Lee Jackson worked into the script stressed the human tragedy, Kosminski choreographed his camera movements to appear spontaneous, creating an authentic documentary feel.
Well, it, it's kind of weird because we never, because there was nobody here, we never identified where the house where the massacre took place was. But there was something really creepy about this spot. You can see these flattened castrol oil bottles, which we, we kicked to one side. They were across the road, like a barrier. And there was something incredibly chilling about it. It just felt like, don't go beyond there. But now what we've just discovered is that it was right outside the house where this massacre that we recreated in the film occurred. Peter and Lee Jackson didn't see the actual cellar on their trip to Amici, so the corpses are recreated from reference images and testimonies. brings me up short, to be honest, to be here. Um, we looked and looked for this house when we came here with Lee 11 years ago, but I had no way of knowing where it was. We had nobody to guide us. The village was deserted. All the Muslims had fled. And now, by chance, we've happened a, upon the son of the family that were massacred here. And he's shown us this basement. And uh, I wish Lee could have seen it, really. After 15 years of directing other people's scripts, Peter Kosminski wrote and directed his own script for The Government Inspector, a film about the death of David Kelly. You couldn't tell the story of what happened to Dr. David Kelly without telling the story of the battle between the BBC and the government. Central to it all, that September dossier and its claims of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. The BBC and the Gilligan factor. Was Dr. Kelly his source, or was he the fall guy for someone above him? Drawing on Hutton Inquiry evidence, television footage, and interviews with close friends and colleagues, Kosminski embarked on a meticulous research endeavor to write the character of David Kelly. This is where they pasteurize the milk product. <clears throat> Are you sure about that? If this equipment is for pasteurizing baby milk, why does it need double-lined pipe work and a negative pressure containment vessel? That suggests to me that you're more concerned to prevent something toxic getting out than harmful bacteria getting in and ruining your product. And if this is indeed a baby food factory, why does it need a barbed wire fence and guard towers at 50-yard intervals? We're dealing with three things, really. Documentary, drama, and docudrama. There's a strong feeling that documentary is much more authentic than drama, although often there's equally a feeling that drama is much more effective than documentary. Well, I think it's rubbish. And I say this with respect to a very re highly respected documentary maker, but you know as well as I do that every time you choose a bit of sync from my interview or anyone else's, every time you write a line of commentary, every time you juxtapose a bit of sync, with an emotive piece of music. You're manipulating reality. But there is this distinction. I'm talking to Peter Kosminski. Now, if we were doing an interview about an interviewer talking to a writer and director of television documents and drama, there would be a different perception on the part of the audience, and they would have the right to that different perception, wouldn't they? I'm not saying drama and documentary are, aren't different. They are different. There's something about looking into the eyes of the real person that you can never achieve in drama. But documentary can be misleading. But we're talking as if they came out of the same route. Do you think they do? Well, in my case, they do, because in, you know, I started making documentaries, and I still employ researchers. So the root, if you like, the, the soil in which the program grows is the same. The difference is that when you're interviewing on camera, you are actually seeing the person speaking. Whereas when I do it, there's an actor playing the role. But I've still got to ask myself the question, is the impression created by this scene, does that accurately reflect his state of mind? And as long as the answer to that is yes, then I feel what we're doing is legitimate. I suppose the challenge would be, how can you know that it's accurate? When I write a scene, I'm not saying these are literally the words that people said, or that's the color of the wallpaper on the wall behind them. But is the scene 
an accurate impression of what actually took place? Or does it suggest that what was actually quite an amicable conversation was a full-on Barney between two people? The latter is misleading, the former isn't. Peter's a role model, people look up to him because he's been in the rare position where he's managed to make what he wants to make, not always, but most of the time, and that's pretty unusual in our world. It is more difficult to be heard in the current landscape. There's so much white noise, there are so many channels, there are so many competing interests. But Peter's earned the right to have his name above and below the title and to make a Peter Kosminski film because he's brilliantly managed to make films that a lot of people want to watch and yet at the same time a lot of people feel deeply affected by because it changes their perception of the world. And your next project is Palestine. You're not taking the soft option, Peter, are you, really? Well, the, the Middle East conflict lies at the heart of every conflict facing, facing the Western world at the moment. And when one discovers that Britain ruled that area until just 60 years ago, Britain had 100,000 British soldiers there trying to keep the peace between the Arabs and the Jews. And that in many ways, the current situation, the lines that are drawn between those forces are as a result of a botched decolonization by Britain. All the more reason why British program makers should try to analyze what happened then and what's happening now. Thank you very much.